Yes. Okay. It worked. Nice. It looks great. We're all set. Okay. It's always exciting when these things work. <laughs> uh, so thank you for having me. I'm actually now with the Great Lakes Forestry Center and the Canadian Forest Service. So, and this is a uh, project that I have been developing in collaboration with Janoel Kando, uh, Megan Rage from U Ottawa, Clement Bataille also from U Ottawa, and my student Nilo Far Benbidi from U Ottawa. So, thank you very much for joining. I'm Felipe, and I'm a disease ecologist and an isotope ecologist, and I'm trying to figure out ways in which we can monitor sprout bus budworm dispersal. Today, I'm just going to concentrate on what I have been doing on sulfur, which I find really exciting. So before I go too deep here, uh, I want to explain that isotopes are alternative forms of the same element. Uh, that means that they have the same number of protons, the same atomic number, uh, they for this also the same number of electrons, but they differ in their number of neutrons, which means that they differ in their mass, and therefore their physical properties, but not their chemical properties. They vary also in their relative proportions with some uh, being, some of these uh, isotopes being predictable in space. So I'm here showing you sulfur and sulfur has four stable isotopes. 32 is the most abundant with 95% of uh, the abundance of sulfur being like this 32S. And the other one that we work a lot with is 34S which is heavier and also less abundant. The other two forms are not very common. So sulfur, as I mentioned, is one of these isotopes that varies predictably in space. And it does so because of fractionation, which is basically differences in mass leads to differences in the concentration of light versus heavy isotopes in, the, in space and in response to biophysical processes. So let me... Put my little marker thing here, the laser pointer. There we go. So uh, sulfur isotope ratios on the surface vary in response to several of these processes. First, ocean water has a high and very stable values of D34S, which stays around like 20 per mil. Uh, when seawater uh, and sulfates evaporate, these sulfates that are evaporating or they're moving inland as sea spray have also at about 20 per mil a value of D34S. But as they are being carried inland, the high values start to be depleted. So for example, there is rain or there's the position of the sea spray and the heavier isotopes are going to fall first, which means in turn that the gas that is carrying them is going to be depleted on those heavy isotopes and it's going to have lower values of the D34S. As you keep moving inland, those values are going to continue to drop. So there will be a gradient in this D34S distribution inland. But there are also other things that make sulfur vary, like for example, the local geology, especially when you are far away from the sea. And this varies in relation to the availability of sulfates and sulfates depending on the types of rocks that you have present. One thing that is missing from this diagram is the role of burning fossil fuels, which also affects the sulfur signals. So, that is also going to be important, but not that important for my presentation. So how can we use isotopes for geolocation? Well, we check first for what is the bioavailable ratio of isotopes of a given element and use those as a reference to locate organisms. And this works because as I was mentioning, isotopes vary predictably in space. So the really important thing here is that as an organism like these fruit trees here, build their tissue, they incorporate the local signal from the minerals, and water that they are consuming. And this is passed through the food chain up to from this spruce tree to my little spruce budworm moth. Uh, the really key thing here and that, that is important to understand is that when this organism moves, it will carry with it the signal of the place where they form that tissue. So for example, in this diagram here, I'm just doing a cartoon where I'm showing you two sites that vary in their isotopic value, one that has an isotopic value of red, and one has an isotopic value of blue. This isotopic value is transferred through the food chain. And what is really interesting is that when this spruce budworm, for example, moves from the side where it grew to another side, let's say from the red side to the blue side, we are going to be able to infer two things, that that spruce budworm is not from the area where we collected it. And then we can sort of use the isotopic values to trace back that it came from our red zone. So that is basically what we do when we're doing geolocation. 
with a little bit more nuances than that, but that's it. So just let me take a step back here and tell you a little bit about this organism, just in case you're not familiar. So this is the most important and severe pest of the boreal forest. It feeds on balsam fir and spruces, and it has like a fascinating life cycle, but what you really need to know here is that it spends most of its uh, second instar and most of its life, like hibernating, then it pops out as a young second instar and starts feeding and it feeds and feeds and feeds and grows massively until it gets to the pupa stage, which is very short lived, it's like 10 days. And then it gets to the adult stage, which again is very short lived, but this is the main point of interest to us because it's where it keeps going to, to basically emerge, mate, lay eggs, disperse, which is what I'm most interested in, and then lay eggs again and die. And in some instances, this dispersal is what leads to outbreaks. And outbreaks are really important. Uh, this multi-annual defoliation in outbreak areas has severe impacts. Indirectly, it causes high average of tree mortalities and high impacts on, on tree growth. So it reduces growth. In turn, this has like really severe impacts on the economy, on the social aspects. And of course, it has like severe environmental impacts too. So dispersal, I was, I was saying, is a key driver of these outbreaks. And what we have been noticing more recently is that in the spread, the dispersal is the key driver of the spread and synchronization of these outbreaks. And individuals at high density sites, like these heavily defoliated areas here, uh, then disperse into other areas and can potentially disperse in quite massive numbers. And when they do that, they contribute to a drastic increase in the density of the local population. So that could potentially shift individuals from a stable equilibrium where they are endemic and pretty much controlled by their enemies and like stochastic survival to a stage where they are actually out of control uh, in an epidemic stage where neither enemies or stochasticity in the survival can really control the population. And this is what is leading to the spread of the outbreak. Uh, so because dispersal is a critical role, has played a critical role, if we understand dispersal, we can better predict the conditions that drive these outbreaks, then predict the spread better, and also develop better tools to manage the population changes before they reach a new equilibrium. Yet, of course, tracing the movement of spruce badborn has been incredibly challenging for several reasons. Among those is that traditional methods to monitor animal dispersal are really difficult to apply to this system because there is substantial gene flow. So molecular tools don't work and these things are too small and too numerous to really use radio tag or mark recapture. We believe instead that we could use isotopes to track the dispersal since isotopic tools don't suffer from these limitations. And in a nutshell, what I'm trying to show you today is our test to see whether we can use sulfur isotopes, D34S, to assess Eastern spruce dispersal. And the two main objectives here is to confirm whether dispersal events have occurred at the site. So basically it is a part local versus immigrant individuals that are captured at those sites. And then once we have a good idea of what is the local isotopic signal, use analytical techniques and modeling to assign potential origins of these migrants. So how do you build an isoscape, which is the first step? Well, uh, to do this first, we need to ask a lot of people to help you. And like, I'm sure that several persons in the audience have been sending samples to us and been of major help to, to our project. So first you collect uh, a lot of samples which are geo-referenced, and then you measure the D34 signal in these samples. For this, we collected leaf samples of balsam fir and spruce and complemented those with several samples of milkweed in the USA. For Canada, it's all spruce and balsam fir, but we wanted to have a good idea of how salt for and D34S specifically varies in space. The second step of this is you model the regional isoscape. And to do this, you extract values from several predictor layers at coordinates in the locations where you took samples. And these predictor layers can include things like, for example, geology, temperature, precipitation, salinity deposition, distance from the coast, aridity, pH, etc. All things that we believe could have a role in influencing sulfur. Then we use machine learning and random forest regressions with these variables to try to see how they influence or whether they influence the D34S values of those sites. 
And from that, we generate a model of sulf sulfur variation in space. So here I'm just showing you the main variables that were selected, the six variables that were selected after using variable selection with random forest. And the top three variables represent a sulfate deposition. So basically this is wet, dry, and salinity deposition in our area of study. And you can see that these values rapidly decline away from coastal areas that are influenced by strong wind. Then uh, th then this basically reflect the position of evaporated and oceanic sulfates and sea spray. Then another variable that was important was the distance from the coast, which again is more or less a proxy for sulfate deposition. More interestingly though, we find that dust aerosol deposition, which is basically mineral dust that is generated in arid places and then transported by atmospheric circulation in a north-south gradient was also important, um, relatively important. And then mean annual precipitation also played a role. And we know precipitation plays a role because it affects the availability of sulfates, but also because it affects the position and uh, fractionation. So I'm going to skip this one because it reiterates the same idea, but specifically how this links to the sulfur deposition, which is not as important. And this is the first, to our knowledge, Canadian D34S isoscape for the, the leaves. And it covers a range from 20 to uh, 20 per mil to about minus five per mil, which is a nice range. Uh, and it highlights that there is variation from the coast to the inland areas. And it is a lot more gradual than the 10 kilometers that has been suggested in a few recent papers. So we have a nice gradient and it's a slow gradient that we can use. Uh, this means that we have enough spatial variation and at a reasonable scale to be used for geolocation. So another thing is that this is really valuable because we can use this isoscape after calibration to assess the movement of other species. So mammals, birds, not just insects. But I'll show you how we do this for, for spruce batworm. So to develop a calibrated spruce batworm tissue uh, isoscape, we need to use that foliar isoscape first and then contrast the values on the foliar isoscape to known origin or at least local sample moths. So what we did here is that we collected georeferenced moths that were known to be local in automatic traps. We have been using these automatic traps that were set by Jan Noel and some collaborator in the provinces. And then we also set several field enclosures where we put nets on branches and we collected the pupa afterwards or we collected the adults after a while. So we know for certain that those moths had grown their tissues in that specific area. And what we find there is that, as you can see, the moth tissue on the y-axis here has a very strong correlation with the predicted values at sites from the isoscape. And you can also see that there is more or less a one per mil fractionation from the isoscape value, basically from the foliar isoscapes, to the moth, which means that this is very tightly correlated. Uh, and that we can also be very strongly confident on our assignments of tissue uh, from the unknown, when we have unknown origin tissues in this, in this isoscape. So overall, really good news, very exciting information. What I'm showing you here now is the calibrated map here, the average moth tissue map, uh, which if you were paying attention to the, to the polar isoscape, they look very similar and this is really good. This is good because it means that they are tightly correlated. On the left is another tool that we use, which is our uncertainty raster. And this is basically tells us about what is the certainty for that we have for these model values. So the, model, the values that we have modeled in this isoscape. And it's also again, like very exciting because most of the zone that we cover, except some urban areas, potentially because of that uh, burning of fossil fuels, most of the areas that we cover have about a two per mil or less uncertainty, which means that we are, have a very reliable tool. So now how do we apply this to identifying Im immigrants and identifying these locals? So what I'm showing you here is the first site close to the coast, which is in Nova Scotia, it's called Arisite. And here putative locals were captured early in the season and immigrants were captured after the local populations had died. Immigrants came from an event that was detected by radar in July 2023, in July 23 of 2020. 
And if you compare the signal of the individuals determined as local versus immigrants here on this panel, you can see that there is potentially some misidentification. These individuals shouldn't have been identified as a local. It has a very different solve for signal, right? Uh, but importantly, two of these immigrants have a significantly different isotopic signal from the local signal, which means that we can tease these guys apart from the locals. And more importantly, when you took the immigrant, when we took the immigrant values and applied them to the model, uh, basically using that average and uncertainty isoscapes to predict where is their possible source of origin, we find this. In red, you have the high probability of origin, and in blue, um, dark blue, that is a low probability of origin. The capture site is here, by the way. And if some areas of highest probability, those red areas here, tend to match uh, areas where we know there are uh, heavy defoliation, for example, the Gaspi Peninsula and some sites in New Brunswick, and locations that are ba basically under heavy outbreaks. The other site that I want to show you is uh, Inverness, which is also again in Nova Scotia in the coast. And what you can see here, again, is that it is a population where immigrants also came after the local populations had collapsed. And in the same day as the Arisag event. So potentially they might be coming from the same pool of immigrants. Uh, all immigrant individuals are significantly different from the local values, as you can see here. And uh, which shows that the, we can tease apart locals from immigrants by using sulfur alone. Like, remember, this is just using sulfur as a tool to tease apart locals versus immigrants. And second, we have a much more sharper probability of origin area with much says, outbreak zones and plausible source from these malls. Again, the Gaspi Peninsula and parts of New Brunswick. What is outstanding here is that the only information that we have provided for this model is the D34 forest values and the isoscapes. So there is no phenology or distribution of spruce batworm. And yet we are finding that assignments highlight zones that can be under current outbreak and thus likely sources of immigration only based on the sulfur signal. So as a take home message, I want you to think that first, our D34S isoscape is the first in Canada and it's an excellent model so far for the distribution of D34S in space and can be well calibrated to insect tissues. Then that our model can allow to tease apart, sorry, that D34S can allow to tease apart locals versus immigrants when we look without any further information at presumed immigrants and locals. So it's a good tool to tease apart these potential immigration events. And finally, that we can really seem to be using it consistently as a potential geolocation tool. So we need to do further tests, but this is very encouraging. And with that, I just want to thank the people and institutions that make my research possible. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Felipe. That was a wonderful talk. We do have some questions coming in here. Um, how can you tell the difference between a local and immigrant moth? Are the local moths collected before the predicted immigration event? Uh, well, it's it's a little bit more complicated by that than that. Like in principle, just by looking at the at the uh, the sulfur signals, we can tell that things are not potentially coming from the same side, right? Like what I showed you in those previous graphs uh, is clearly saying that some of the immigrant moths are coming from a more inland area, whereas the locals are in a more coastal area. That because they have higher D34S values that match a more coastal, close to the sea area. Plus, what I have not been explaining before is that the individuals that we trapped as immigrants or uh, locals came from uh, automated pheromone traps that basically have uh, take photos every certain number of hours. So they take photos after the sunset, which is the point where most of the local activity happens. And then they take another photo really late in the morning, uh, which is the time where you have uh, the most immigration activity happening, right? Plus the ones that we identify as putative immigrants there were also uh, detected by radar. So we know that those individuals were moving from another place and there was no local activity in the previous week 
before the appearance of those individuals. So there are several lines that, that tell us that those guys were immigrants. Very cool. Thank you so much. We have time for this one last question here. Um, do you know if this methodology might be utilized for other insects or species like jack pine budworm or mountain pine beetle? That's what we think. Like that, that's what we're hoping. Uh, the key thing is that it needs, there needs to have been movement, right? So it's not going to tell you if the organism has already grown in a site. Like, but if you want to tease apart individuals that you know grow in a specific place versus individuals that have not grown there, we can do that. Uh, so it's really effective when things are moving, when there is dispersal, when you have potential uh, transport of uh, invasives from different countries, from different provinces, from different locations within a province, that we can do. But it's not going to tell you for a second, third generation where the organism is like an invasive. It's just going to tell you that it has grown there. Right. Okay, awesome. Good to know. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate your time and you had a great, excellent presentation. Thank you very much. All right, I'll be introducing our next speaker here. 